All right. Hello, Nelson. We will, we're going to get started in just a moment. I got to dial into the room. You are in the Zoom meeting now. Okay, just doing a test to make sure that I'm, oh, I think I am. Okay, I think we're, On screen. All right, second question for Nelson is, can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, we're okay. good. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the one screen because kind of distracting over here.
this particular issue we're dealing with right now is going to come up during the presentation today. Okay, I might just use the one, the one screen over here. Okay, so hopefully we'll get this down to like a two minute process instead of like a five minute process. I still don't know why I'm echoing through my machine here. Okay, better. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about fundamentals. Last time when we were in class, we spent some time talking about the syllabus and uh, over like the broad brush, like here's all the different, I'm just throw all the words at you. Um, and uh, Hopefully we find something interesting in there. Um, today I want to talk a little bit more about information. And if we have some time, we'll start getting into some more fundamentals like uh, color models. Um, uh, before we jump into the math next week. Um, but I did want to spend some time uh, talking about the homeworks and the research project before we jumped into this so that you have a kind of a clear picture of what, what kind of work uh, do you expect to have to do this uh, semester. So I'm going to go and open up Blackboard. And that's not Blackboard. Here we go, Blackboard. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna, first of all, we're, we're gonna talk about two main things. There's the uh, homework and then there's the journey in CG um, uh, project that we're gonna be working on. So let me just go over the homework uh, at first and just reiterate that the amount of time that I expect or that I'm anticipating you'll have to do on homework is anywhere from about four to six hours per week, I'm thinking. That's reading, doing programming projects, doing the research project and, and all that. I'm not trying to use all of your time. So please give me feedback if, if this stuff is starting to be a, a little bit of a, a time sink, if you will. Okay, so uh, there's uh, two templates um, that we're going to be using for submitting homework. So the only thing that you're gonna submit on Blackboard is a PDF file, okay? And the programming work that you do is going to be done on GitHub. So you should make a repository on GitHub, it's called CS484, um, that you can then put all your work inside of it. And that way, when I grade it, I can just pull from your GitHub and run your, your project, take a look at your source code. And I think that'll go over uh, easier uh, for grading, I think, than trying to have you submit source code files through GitHub. It's, it's almost as bad as emailing your source code uh, it's just not a good idea. Okay, so uh, so the first template, I'm gonna go ahead and click on it, is, make sure it looks okay. Okay, so the, the first, um, uh, essentially what you have on Overleaf is they, they assemble everything in as a project. Oh, it's not showing. That screen seems stuck. It's very strange. Um, let me 
share. Oh, gotcha. Share the uh, screen. Okay, that's the magic. Uh, that's the magic. Yeah, that's what I need to show from now on. The screen, not an application. Okay. All right. So, um, so we have a, a product. So Overleaf. So if you never logged into Overleaf before, you should definitely do that uh, this week. Uh, if you don't have a GitHub account, which I think is unlikely at this point, uh, set that up as well. Um, and so the way that uh, Overleaf works is you'll have a number of projects. So these are projects that I have inside my uh, uh, directory. So, uh, for example, we have the, I'm going to show you the 484 report template and the, and the project report. So let me go over here. So when I, when I load these up, um, this has the LaTeX, and you'll see that there's different files. So main dot. Tex is the is where basically you'll do all your editing. Uh, Preamble.tex has has a bunch of let me minimize that. You know, I'm using a bunch of packages like the uh, uh, graphics, so we can actually include images. Or uh, there's some mathematics ones in there as well. I think. Oh, that's a, that's included by something else. But um, yeah, I basically have a, a bunch of packages that I know we're going to use uh, for for this um, for the homework. And so what you'll do is you, you'll go in there and then you just change what needs to be changed. So over here, this this weekend, we're working on homework zero. So you change that to homework zero. And when you hit control S, the, the website, uh, the website knows that you want to recompile it essentially. So if we change that to zero, then, uh, then you'll notice that it recompiles everything. The PDF has the new content that you were that you were looking for. Okay, um, and then you'll just change the report name if if you need to, or you can delete that if it's just a homework, uh, and then put your name in there. Um, and to make it really easy, uh, if you go to the menu, you can make a copy of the project. All right, so this will this will allow you to copy it to your own uh, Overleaf account, and then you can just use that going forward for each homework, just make a copy of the previous one and, um, and, and do your changes. All right. So, um, we're, we'll go over this real quick, but just to kind of show you the different parts. So normally for the homework assignment, you're asked to write some kind of program, some kind of graphics related program. In the beginning, we're, we're doing games. And as we get through the second half of the course, and we'll be starting work on a ray tracer. Um, and so, uh, so for whatever the main assignment is going to be, <coughs> uh, you'll you'll write just a paragraph of how you designed your program. So basically, just introducing what you did and a postmortem, like what happened, what went right, what went wrong. Just so we're just doing some project management stuff, you know, just getting used to that that cycle. And then I normally ask a number of questions. So uh, they're normally graphics related. Although the first one is really just kind of like, you know, what kind of graphics experience do you have, and you know. Simple, simple questions that are uh, shouldn't be too hard to uh, to go through. And then uh, we normally do a sample output. So you'll put like a screenshot of your program and uh, you can post the, the main source code to, to your program. So you don't need to put everything in here. Just put like where your main program is, what it looks like. And then that way uh, in Blackboard, I can put comments on your code um, and it's all nice and uh, it, it, everything looks professional and polished and, and then you guys can get some really good feedback on, uh, I try to give feedback on, on everything that you, that you do. And, uh, so there's, there's that part. That's what the, um, that's more or less what that file is going to look like when it's all finished. Okay. And it's just a text file, uh, text-based format. So you can just go in there. Uh, but the nice thing about LaTeX is that, you know, it's got lots of macros, um, really good for putting mathematics and stuff in there, which I think is really good. It's a it's used a lot for scientific journals, uh, book writing and so on. So I, I wanted to expose something to you that wasn't Microsoft Word that is, is more powerful than Microsoft Word. And you notice that in here, you're not, you're not focusing on things like, well, how big should the font be? 
or uh, what color do I make this? It's more or less you can focus on the content and uh, this kind of mirrors the, the process of how books were written uh, a little while back, right? You write the manuscript and then you give it to the publisher and they do all that stuff. They say this goes on page one, page two, page three, and they worry about that. Okay. Uh, nowadays, though, um, we're expected to kind of do all of this. And, and I'll show you uh, a little bit the, the power of this uh, in just a second. Okay, so that's the, the report template that goes along with the homeworks. Uh, so let me go back. Let me move this around. Okay, so... Uh, I have I, I basically put all the homeworks in here, but some of them are just templates for I have to edit the details. So I'm going to say that they're subject to change up until the previous Wednesday before the due date. So that gives me a chance to kind of gauge where everybody is in the class. So whether we need to push something back or ask something different depends on I'd like the, this to be somewhat flexible. Let's take a look at uh, homework zero. And uh, homework zero um, is, you know, the questions are what computer graphics topics are you interested in? What standard gra graphics API are you most interested in learning and so on? Um, and then I, I wanted to introduce you to one hour game jam because we're going to be doing this a few times, uh, partially because the, the Ludum Dar, Dare uh, game jam is in October, early October. So if you've ever done game jams or you always wanted to do that, um, this is a, a great way to get practice. And uh, the, the whole premise of the one hour game jam is to see, uh, oh, got to fix that link. Dot com. All right. So the, the whole premise of one hour game jam is that every Saturday at about noon our time, they they just uh, they, they put a, a theme. So this last one that they just did was time travel. So people start working, a, you know, for about an hour or two and try to make a game in an hour. It's actually harder than you think, but you could probably do something in, in just a matter of two or three hours. And so I just wanted to put something where you're like, okay, you have to do it, but it's not like this huge time, uh, time sink. Um, and the other thing too, is that it, it helps, uh, get you jumpstart on how do I do a graphics project? Like how do you get started on something, uh, right away? And just as a way of reference, I can kind of show you, this is something I started doing a few years ago. Um, show you that the first one is called the lost button and uh the idea with the lost button i think the theme was one button so it was kind of like okay uh so i had done i was doing html5 and i was just kind of teaching myself how to do all this stuff and and at the end of like two hours i was like this is not coming together so anyways i, I came up with this like really terrible story it's like one two three try to add some mood to it um and uh, counts to 10, it's about the button that got away. And so I just took like the simplest game idea possible, which is Candyland. And I just like, okay, well, you press one button and you roll dice and, and you see what happens at the end of the game. I mean, it's basically that simple. So, you know, you have to move at least 25 steps. So we have 22 steps to go and it just kind of gives you different things and random things can happen to you. Like you were forced to move a step back because you decided to play a game of basketball. Just I just made up random stuff. So I'm not like looking for AAA game title here. I'm just looking for something to get started. Uh, but one thing I found is that um, I might start with an idea of the one weekend and then uh, keep keep progressing with that idea. So you'll you'll notice in these ones that. Um, I, I was like, okay, let's do some simple sprites. And in this one, it's a game about physics, but nothing really happens. Okay, that's that's what I got done that weekend. Okay, but then I was like, okay, well, we'll, we'll do some more. So then the following weekend, uh, the, the theme was gold. So I, th I thought, okay, well, I can do something. Um, I can do something with gold. So I'm using the same idea here. And I think... 
I'm supposed to touch something. I got to look for it, though. Oh, there it is. The creature from the Black Lagoon. So now he's gold. <laughs> and then it just kind of keeps repeating. It kind of keeps repeating um, until I find the next guy or wherever they might be. So I ran out of time. Okay. So I took that and then you'll see, oh, there was a little loss. This was before, this was before the gold one, but um, in, in this one, you basically just are looking for something. So every week I just built on top of what I did last time. Doesn't necessarily have to be a, a huge thing, but you can definitely come up with like a little bit of a, of a story arc. And then I took a little break and then I started making some, some different ones. And I was like, okay, I'm getting sprites, uh, getting sprites down. So I started doing these, like, like a side scrolling shooter game with fish and crustaceans. And this is basically, you know, I just kind of kept, you know, working my way up to this. It's, uh, pretty simple. It's got some bugs in it. So the next one was, um, theme was like cash and you can tell i'm really starting to like get some momentum here and uh so this is like a that seems like this is in the wrong order something is not right seawall i forgot to show you seawall this was the next week okay so uh but this one um you could actually send out these like there's there's more more creatures and you know, I was able to do some more sophisticated kind of game logic. And uh, what was fun about that is, is um, you know, as you're, as you're like building up expertise in this, it's not like a huge, you know, you, you'll probably be excited about working on it the next week. It's like, oh, what, what else can I do the next week? How can I make it better? All right. So one hour game jam, I think is a really good, just fun way of like, okay, let's, let's do some graphics. Where is my... blackboard thing okay so apologize i gotta fix that link in the uh in the homeworks <clears throat> okay um so I i'm just curious what you're able to do this weekend so like i said it this is more like let's just get started there's there's no grade for the first homework you just have to turn it in but it's not like you're gonna like get an f and then it's gonna like mess you up the rest of the semester it's really just make sure that everything is working as intended. And then the uh, following homeworks, what I'm looking at next week are, uh, I got to come up with questions for next week, but you know, use a 3D engine to do a one hour game jam. So uh, I'm pretty flexible for the homeworks. If you want to use uh, like Unity or Unreal Engine or uh, some other like HTML5 engine or some other type of thing, you know, that you're particularly interested in, then uh, I would say feel free to. Um, and uh, so if, if you do that, though, make sure that there's a, a Windows build on on your GitHub so I can actually run it, um, especially Unity, because that's one of those you compile with a different version, and then you can't just you just can't use the other a different build or a different editor for that. OK, and um, uh, probably next week we're gonna we're gonna start because we're we're gonna be working with a uh, a C plus um, plus engine to kind of you know kind of homegrown so we kind of see how three D engines are built from from scratch uh, so <laughs> anyway we'll see we'll see how things are are progressing for next week all right and more or less the homework assignments are gonna be pretty similar to that. Um, the we're, we're going to have a strong emphasis on games uh, initially uh, up to the beginning of October, because that's when the Ludum Dare uh, challenge is. So you'll have a lot of experience making something. And the, the Ludum Dare one, I made sure that there's no other homeworks for the class on that week. And uh, that's because I'm expecting that you'd probably want to put five to eight hours worth of effort into that particular one. It's a very exciting time. Everybody's working on games all around the world you know, for two days straight or three days straight. Um, so if you have more questions, you know, feel free to, to bring them up uh, in class. Okay, so those are the homework assignments. So they're generally designed to go along with what we're talking about in class and also just get you some experience, um, make a little portfolio by the, by the time you're done. The second thing is the, the journey project. So this is the research project of the class. 
And uh, I'm still filling in the details for this particular one, but we can take a look at the template for that one. And you'll notice that this template is, um, is much, it looks a lot different. In fact, I, I actually use one of the, um, the ACM journal template for this one. And there's 10 parts to this particular um, homework assignment. And it's worth, uh, we have a, a total grade scale of 10,000 points. So this is worth 1,500 because 15% of the, of the class. So each part is worth 150 points. And so we'll start out initially this weekend with the author bio. So you'll, you'll basically just kind of talk about who you are, just introduce yourself and um, what you hope to, to learn in the class, skills you're, you're hoping to get. Um, and, you know, most importantly, we want to find out what you hope to learn out of this class. Because I, I feel like if you put a learning goal up front, then you'll be motivated to, to, uh, to actually accomplish that if you say, this is what I want to learn. So if you say, I want to learn about user interfaces, well, then at the end of the, the whole project, then you will add a little blurb in there. This is what I learned about user interfaces. That way, you know, we kind of make things that are uh, things come into reality rather than just be like, oh, I wish I wanted to do that, but I never got a chance to. So we want to put some learning goals up front. Then the, uh, the next part is uh, your project ideas. So this is about three three weeks into the course. Um, if we look, if we look on the syllabus, we've, we've got, let me go to the syllabus. Oh, I have one open here. Okay. And the syllabus more or less, uh, I've got all the details there. Let me maximize this. Um, so the, the author bio is due the first week. Then we have the pitch um, that's coming up. So the pitch is where you kind of talk about what are your, what ideas do you have for the project that you want to do? And the theme is a journey in computer graphics. So we're, we're thinking of some kind of, of theme, um, of some journey before 1900. Uh, that's, that's kind of my, um, my thing there. And I have, I have instructions inside the overleaf, uh, throughout the code. So let's look through the code real quick. So <laughs> I try to spell everything out. So if you find anything that's not clear, we can, we can help do that. So there's the author bio, there's the pitch. Okay. So the other, the other limitation is that G or PG rated in nature. So I don't want uh, people to find out that we made like some, some crazy horror hack and slash game or something like that, <laughs> or a project, you know, uh, we want to stick to, to things that are, you know, uh, they have broad appeal to the general, the general public. Okay. So, uh, come up with like a couple of ideas, you know, think of two or three ideas for a journey that you think would be interesting to pursue. And then maybe pick one of those and, and, and um, kind of explore it a little bit more. So we talked about the Colorado river, for example, on, on Monday. So maybe that's something, that's an idea you want to explore and, and maybe be like, Oh, this is interesting. You know, there was these these uh, towns along the Colorado River that were really big for, you know, mining or, or something like that. And you kind of come up with, with some kind of story arc. And and the reason is because, you know, computer graphics, a lot of times we are trying to tell a story. About, and, and this kind of helps us think about that. OK. And then the most important part of this, well, it's, it, it's just as important, is, you know, don't forget to talk about a graphics problem that you're hoping to, to learn or solve. OK. And um, after that uh, is the pitch. So you just write one sentence, one little blurb that says, here's what I want to do. OK. And at that point in the class, we're, we're all going to share this information with everybody. So you say, this is my idea. This is what I'm going to do. And then at the end, we'll have a final presentation where you get to show everybody what you worked on. I'm really excited to see all the different ideas you're going to come up with. OK. Then there's the uh, proposal. And the proposal is, this is about the technical project uh, that you want to work on. And the proposal comes up two weeks after that. So I'm not like trying to push too much stuff in. So this gives you two weeks to think about what do you want to actually work on as far as a computer graphics uh, topic. So uh, for example, if this was AI class, it would be neural networks, but maybe you want to do ray tracing, physically based lighting, something like that. Okay, and don't, just be aware that you're proposing a programming project for this. So, you know, so if you say I'm going to do um, 
physically based lighting, it means that you're actually going to try like implementing uh, an equation for physically based lighting and not just talk about it. So just uh, to be aware of that. So the assignment that comes um, after that, technically uh, you see, we jump from, uh, this is actually from three to five and that's cause there's an update due in the middle there. So if we go to the, the schedule, you'll see we do the bio, the pitch, the proposal, then we do an update a few times through the uh, semester. So you can kind of give pro, you know, here's what I'm, here's what I'm working on. Okay. Um, so you have your proposal here and then the state of the art and what the state of the art is, is a way for us to, um, if we're going to work on a graphics problem and this is what happened in any job you'd, you'd get, there's a problem at work. Well, we want to know what's the best way to solve it. Like as of right now, you know, if you had to go buy an off the shelf product to do something, what's the best one to do. Right. So for example, uh, at home, I'm getting a NAS to install my house so I can like backup files and stuff like that. So I could just say, well, okay, I could buy a computer and stick some hard drives in there, install Linux, find some backup software that'll work. Um, but I bet that would take a long time and it probably wouldn't even be very good. So, uh, so what I did instead is I researched different NASs that are out there. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy a network attached storage device that does all this stuff for me. And, and then you, then you, then you ask yourself the question, once you know what that is, then how do you take that the next step for the next step forward? Okay. So, and, and I say this cause my past experience is that I, I like to solve lots of graphics problems, but it felt like as I do more research on them, like all this stuff is solved in the seventies and eighties, <laughs> you know, some of like the basic things like, uh, fong shading or blend fong shading or some of these other things that are just like really common, but they just haven't like trickled down to the device you're currently using. Um, so it's, it's always important to kind of know, you know, what is state of the art. So in the state of the art, it's really more of like a background research. So you just like, okay, look at this paper here, this paper here. So if you're undergraduate, I'm expecting uh, five journal or conference articles that you looked at to talk about your research. And if you're a graduate student, then I'm expecting eight uh, journal or conference articles. All right. So, uh, and, and that'll, that'll be good practice for, you know, just doing research in general. So this will kind of show this is well researched and, and so on. Okay. Now the project updates, there's, like I said, there's three of them. And the idea here is that you would include three artifacts. So it could be some charts you're working on or some screenshots of what, what you're working on. This is just like a quick, you know, it's meant just to take a few minutes of your time. Like, Hey, here's what I've been working on. Here's, here's how I'm making progress, uh, in this, um, uh, in this particular area. Okay. And as an, as an option, if you don't want to like do three project updates, you could substitute one of them for a game jam. So if you, if you're having a lot of fun, with the game jams, like I want to do more of this, then feel free to, to do a, uh, game jam instead of one of them. So I expect at least two project updates, but, uh, there's, there's that. Okay. So as we get close to the end, going back to the schedule, uh, you know, we're getting close to uh, Thanksgiving break. So, um, so what's going to be happening after that is we're basically being, we'll be finished with our projects. Okay. So this is our, our time to share our results with everybody. Um, talk about the, uh, what went right, what went wrong. Okay. That, that all happens before the presentation. And this is just your way of, of talking about, Hey, what happened? You know, did you meet your goals? Um, how would you like to work on it in the future? Those kinds of things. How did you do it? What tools did you use? Okay. Um, and then evaluation, you know, how did you check to make sure that, you know, what things did you do to like critically look at your work while you were doing it to make sure whether you're on the right track or, or not. Okay. Um, and then the, the postmortem is just kind of a bigger version of what we've already been doing for the homeworks the whole time. Okay, what went right, what went wrong, what things could we improve on? Okay. And, and that's more or less about it for the project report. Okay. So this is a change in the past. I probably would have uh, had you do a, an actual like academic journal type paper, but I think this is a little bit 
a little bit easier because you get to share more of what happened along the way rather than focus so much on like one finished product at the end. So this is something we can build on the whole semester rather than like save a giant term paper for the end, which I know everybody would be thrilled about. <laughs> okay. So, um, that is the, that is the, uh, the, the journey, um, and of course, I'm always interested in feedback. So if you have any ideas or things that you would help to make it more fun, I am all ears, you know, feel free to, uh, uh, you know, uh, share with me your ideas. Um, so the, the, the overall goal for this is to be fun, to be a, an excellent learning tool for you to grow in your computer graphics uh, knowledge. All right, any questions at all about homework or grading? Sure. Um, so my plan is to develop a starting template in C++ for you guys to use on the homeworks, especially as we get further on. Okay, so it takes a lot of work to get a graphics engine going from scratch. It's, it's a lot of work. So I'm I'm working on getting you a little bit of a boost up that. So if I can get something working that runs on a Raspberry Pi, and Windows and Mac, then you at least have something you can start off with. It's not, uh, you know, dealing with a black screen or something. Because as we get through the course, we want to do things like shaders, uh, um, things like that, that would be uh, more difficult to do if you had to do it from scratch. So, uh, the only thing I would do is just make sure that your computer is up to doing whatever we're going to do. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of ironic that a raspberry Pi sometimes is more capable than like a laptop that's like a few years old. It's, <laughs> um, I, I've seen this happen, uh, uh, just because it's just a newer manufacturing process and they have new drivers and so on. So, uh, th there's a there's a few tools uh, in particular that I want us to get some experience one with. One is called Dear I Am GUI. Anybody heard of that one? Dear I Am GUI. So it's actually a really uh, um, cool graphical user interface that you can put into your C++ code to create debug interfaces for your graphics programs. And they've you know, and it, it works with this this model of okay you just, you call the one function and you say, here's a checkbox. And this is the variable you should store the, the result in. It's called an immediate mode graphical user interface. And then the next line would be, um, here's a button and here's the action it should take. So it's very different than programming something in with like .NET where it's more like drag and drop where you put all your controls and then you double click on the control and add the callback code for that. So it's not a callback based it's actually running that say 60 frames a second and actually checking to see has the mouse gone over your button and did it go down since the last frame. It's a very different way of doing a graphical user interface, but is very useful for graphics because most of the time when you have a, you know, a graphics context, like an OpenGL buffer or a DirectX buffer, you can't just draw. It's kind of weird. You can do it in your web browser, but you can't just normally do it in a program. You can't just say, well, let's stick a button here on top and let's stick a text box here on top. It's normally you have basically assigned like a, a rectangular region for the GPU to do whatever it wants to it. And you can't just normally stick controls right on top of it. Web browsers are different because uh, it's all part of a compositing uh, that's taking place underneath the hood. So before you know, when the web browser draws everything, everything's in layers. So even the WebGL that you're drawing is another separate layer. And so it knows how to draw things on top of it. But regular Windows applications or Mac OS applications or Linux applications don't work in that, in that way. All right, does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Let's go on to uh, send me the, the main content for, for today. All right, and so where we're going uh, with this is uh, I wanted to talk a, a little bit more about 
what things are possible <coughs> with computer graphics? Maybe something you've never seen before. Um, and what's ironic about these is these are a lot of old ideas that have paved the way for where we are today, but at the same time still kind of, you know, put the pressure on us to like, have you achieved this yet? This, this realization of, you know, this um, idealization of what is possible with a computer. And we, we talked about this idea on Monday, you know, it's what makes the, the, you know, how you interact with a computer is really the whole, the whole, uh, you know, the, uh, the most important part, you know, in terms of why you'd even want to use it to begin with. Okay. And I, I'm going to say that information is probably the most important reason why people use a computer is information. Um, that's not the only reason people use it, right? People use it to play games. People use it to, uh, to draw, paint and so on. Although those, in, in some cases, those are forms of creating information. Um, but the, the power of information is, I think, what makes them most useful. Okay. So I got the idea from this talk from, I mentioned his name, uh, Andy Van Dam from Brown University. And he gave a talk at I3D 2019 this past May in Montreal. And he was kind of reflecting on what revolutions have happened in computers graphics that aren't finished yet. What ideas have been put out there that aren't finished yet? Okay. So um, I, I would encourage you after, uh, you know, go take a look at the slides for the keynote. I don't remember if they have a video, but it was, it was a long keynote. He, he talked for an hour and a half or more. It was, it was very long and he was up against the clock, but nobody wanted to say you have to stop now because it is Andy Van Dam and he's kind of a pioneer. <laughs> you know, that's like saying, I'm sorry, Albert Einstein, you can stop talking now. <laughs> that's it just wouldn't really happen um so uh i might i might bounce back and forth here uh but i was trying to reproduce some of the information in a slideshow uh to kind of summarize some of it so i'm gonna skip the color stuff but <clears throat> um i wanted to talk about uh, i didn't mean for that to pop up so so quickly but there is um a sketchpad system Okay, and Sketchpad is, is invented by Ivan Sutherland, and you'll see a lot of work is done in the 60s. Some of the ideas are pioneered even earlier on than that, and, and they've really been around for a very long time. So Sketchpad basically was, how do you use, how do you talk to the computer? You know, there's this scene in Star Trek IV, if you've ever had a chance to see that one, where Scotty is going to do, he's going to design uh transparent aluminum. So the, the, the guy who owns the shop is, you know, he needs to, he needs to create this transparent aluminum so he can fix the Klingon ship that they're traveling in. Well, <clears throat> so he's uh, well, where do you design at? And he's, he shows him the computer. And so he picks up the mouse and he's like, hello, computer. And <laughs> the guy's like, this guy is weird, you know? So he's like, no, you put the mouse down and, and you control it this way. So, I, uh, the, the image is kind of stuck in my mind, right? Because a lot of times, you know, you want to talk to your computer and I'm, and I bet everybody here has probably talked to a computer here. You might say like, Hey Siri or something like that. You actually try to talk, you know, use your voice to communicate with your, with your device. Okay. So this is a, this is one of those, um, applications where this allows you to communicate with the computer. In this case, the um, they wanted to to do drawing, right? So I have a, a video here, and let's see if, if the audio will come through.
That's not what I was hoping. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, I think I know what I need. Okay, so also 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 on. Okay. <clears throat> so that was uh, 1963 and you'll you'll recognize that a lot of those they don't it, it seems like not a big deal anymore, you know. You're like, "Oh, okay, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't you be able to do that?" But that's one of those, you know, those tools that people were thinking about in in the sixties before, you know, people uh, think about it. If you were going to represent something like that in a computer system before using something like this, you, you very well might have to be on paper and say, well, I put this at X, Y, Z location here, and I need to draw a line to this X, Y, Z position here. And you'd have to manually tell the computer exactly where all those points are. So this, this changes, um, this changes how design happens, you know, as of this point, effectively, you see a huge switch over, you know, uh, to how products are designed. In fact, I would, I would dare say that nobody could get a job and say, yeah, I, I design things. Well, how do you design them on paper? And they'd probably be like, okay, maybe if you're really good, we'll hire you. But I think generally they'd actually want to see the product before it's even before you've had to dedicate any kind of manufacturing experience uh, to that. And, and every decade you see the advances that are made uh, in terms of that. Um, uh, 
my personal experience with that, you know, I used to, I used to have a, I bought a used BMW. I'm not rich. So I bought a used BMW a long time ago and it actually turned out to be like terrible. Uh, it was, I, I didn't spend enough money. <laughs> uh, but it was like a, it was like a 1995 BMW. And I was like, I always want to drive BMW. So I, I bought this uh, car and I had a, a friend at work that was like a, a huge BMW enthusiast. And he really liked the, the models before the nineties when they switched to the computer design stuff. It's very mechanical. And, and, but anyways, you, you can kind of see the, the progress of, you know, how things are designed. You know, most cars nowadays are, you know, maybe a sketch artist, draws what they are imagining, but you know, a car does not get made unless it's all in the computer somewhere. All right. So that was Ivan Sutherland's sketch pad. And, um, just wanted to kind of give you, you know, there are things that we want. These are, these are some, um, some common things about information. So uh, there's the idea of information at your fingertips, something that Bill Gates said in 1990 or information management, you know, how do you get from one, one area of, uh, like, like the internet, right? How do you jump from page to page information management, personal computing? Well, that was another uh, thing, you know, everybody has a computer in their house, probably at this point, whether your devices have fancy computers inside of them as well. Uh, but you know, you probably have more than one computer in your house. That was not the case several decades ago. You might have had to go to a friend's house, you know, who had a computer just to kind of see what it was all about. Um, uh, Ubicomp, there's this idea of like ubiquitous computing. Other, we'll introduce another term called ubiety, which is a, another interesting term. Um, connecting the world, you know, it's you can have conversations with people from Pakistan, you know, or England or China nowadays. That's not something that was possible. Um, uh, even user interfaces, there's there's an element of uh, we've seen advances in there, whether they're good advances or not so great advances. But, um, you know, the first one, information at, at your fingertips, you know, Bill Gates kind of gave this keynote speech. And, uh, you know, a lot of times is that people are not necessarily interested about, oh, I use this device for word processing or I use it for spreadsheets really it's a little bit more it's more like a window you have information in there that's important to you so your spreadsheet might have your finances but it's not the spreadsheet that's important it's your finances that are important or uh, maybe you wrote a letter to a friend it's not the word processor that's important it's the letter you wrote to your friend that's important okay and uh, you know being able to just look back you know uh, sometimes i find it fascinating to read old historical letters you know, but more or less, you know, if you you stuck a stamp on a letter and you sent it off, that was it. You could never like go back and read what you wrote or, you know, look at messages. You know, nowadays we just kind of like, oh yeah, I remember they said that to me a few months ago, and you're like scroll back in your instant messages on your on your phone, and you're like, oh yeah, that's what that's yeah, that's what you said, you know. And so just having that kind of information is is very powerful. Uh, Google's an example, right? Their their mission statement. This is I I pulled this off today. Organizing the world's information, making it universally accessible and useful. Um, that's that's a pretty you know a lot of people think about Google as like search, but really their business is connecting information together. Um, here's a, a very interesting uh, uh, man. His name is. Uh, Vannevar Bush. And in 1945, he wrote this article. Um, I forget the magazine, but there's a there's a link to the, the article. I'll make sure that the slides get posted up on the Blackboard website. But uh, in the introduction to the article, um, he talks about, you know, saying that there's instruments that if we continue working on this, will give us the ability to look at all the knowledge from all past history, something we've not quite realized yet, kind of like, a, you know, what the Library of Alexandria was um, back in the day, the, the kind of central repository of information. 
But this is uh, something he says. Selection by association rather than by ex- indexing may yet be mechanized. One cannot hope thus to equal the speed and flexibility with which the mind follows an associative trail, but it should be possible to beat the mind decisively in regard to the permanence and clarity of the items resurrected from storage. In other words, we don't have perfect memories, but we're generally pretty good at jumping from topic to topic, you know, um, and the, it'd be nice to have some kind of device that would help preserve all those details for us. Okay. <clears throat> so in this article uh, titled, as we may think, um, he, he talks about uh, the idea of what would somebody do with this device? He called it a Memex. And he's talking about, there he goes, building a trail of many items. Occasionally, he inserts a comment of his own, either linking it into the main trail or joining it by a side trail to a particular item. When it becomes evident that the elastic properties of available materials had a great deal to do with the bow, he branches off on a side trail, which takes him through textbooks on elasticity and tables of physical constants. He inserts a page of longhand analysis of his own. Thus, he builds a trail of his interest through the maze of materials available to him. And his trails do not fade. So this is, uh, if you think about, we see this in action right now, right? You have like several tabs on your web browser. You're like browsing something and you're like, oh, what's that? New tab, you know, and you're in that new tab and you're like, look in, it's like, oh, what's that? New tab. And, you know, maybe you jot down some notes. You know, there's some software out there that's uh, kind of try to help us remember these details. But Wikipedia is probably a great example of, of everybody contributing, right? So Wikipedia's got this huge like linked, you know, you can jump from page to page to page kind of examining something. And it doesn't just go away when you're when you're finished. And you kind of you're plus Wikipedia is the kind of thing that if you needed to insert that knowledge into what everybody knows and you can kind of just go in there and do it. All right. So this is a, a very interesting uh, article in terms of like all the things it was like what we would like to do. I don't think we're there yet but i think we see this clearly uh clearly done in the way that we do behave nowadays it's it's clear that this is valuable to us um <clears throat> another uh sentence in there is wholly new forms of encyclopedias will appear ready made with a mesh of associative trails running through them i was like that sounds like wikipedia right there <laughs> but like being able to just generate you know i'm, I'm seeing newer new stuff popping up where, uh, you know, it either summarizes information or, um, you know, tries to be a new body of knowledge for a particular uh, topic. So, uh, so that's, uh, as we may think, 1945. And uh, there is another, um, another guy, his name is Doug Engelbart. And he uh, gave this presentation in 1968. And it's, it's called the mother of all demos. And it's, uh, we're going to watch some of it, um, but it, it impressed a lot of people and it changed a lot of how we interact with the computer. And we're going to see in 1968, all the different ideas or a few of the ideas that they introduced, that he was introducing uh, at that time uh, from his research. group. So I think we're going to click this. I'm going to mute this.
All right. So what do you think about that? <laughs> now you know why it's the mother of all demos. I mean, he basically just everything we use on a computer nowadays, you know, sometimes you like to think, oh, Google Docs, two people editing the document at the same time. And they're like 1968 already did it, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's it's uh, it's kind of amazing that um, the work that they were doing there, like we still see it nowadays. It's just it's, you know, but think about what what was happening before 1968. Most people probably thought computers were for people, you know, with lab coats and they would go in there and type things on punch cards and, you know, have this very, <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, this is pretty, pretty awesome. You know, it was called NLS stood for online system. And a lot of these things, even, even to the, uh, you know, now we know why it's called the mouse. They, they just don't remember why <laughs> it's just, they probably were going to name it something else, but they didn't you know, multiple windows. I mean, all this kinds of, all these kinds of things that took a long time before it was on everywhere. Okay. So it was a big, and people nowadays, you, you could probably watch the whole video and probably be like, Oh, that hasn't been done yet. Uh, or I don't see that happening. And, um, you know, some of that's do just do the way businesses just typically run in the United States uh, and, and around the world. But, you know, there's lots of great ideas that are still kind of coming out. Um, uh, just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about hypertext. So there's a uh, Ted Nelson in, in the sixties, Ted Nelson's a collaborator of uh, Andy Van Dam. And uh, he kind of worked on this thing called Pro project Xanadu in 1960. And it wasn't until a little bit later that we have HTTP. So HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol. That's, that's how documents go across the internet. Okay. Um, it's not the idea of hypertext and, and the idea of hypertext is all about, you know, linking things. It's that associative memory that we, that we looked at earlier, you know, being able to jump from topic to topic to topic. But uh, one, one question that Andy Van Dam kind of posed, you know, have we lost the equality of reading and authoring? So I, I would say that by far, how do most people interact with the internet? Is it, is it an, <laughs> active participant in terms of you're you're in there and you're putting your own information on there or is it just simply consuming information it's more or less like a one-way street nowadays and and then aside from the occasional wikipedia article that you publish or blog post that you put up there um generally speaking it's very difficult you know there is no like there is no sense that you do both and it, i think in its infancy the the idea of hypertext was always about being able to do it both ways. Okay. Not, not to say that Sir Tim Berners-Lee is not greatly accomplished for the work he did with HTTP because we wouldn't really have the internet with all that. Um, especially as we know it nowadays, but there is this idea of, you know, it's, it's a little bit different now. It's harder to go back to because the internet is so per pervasive. Um, so then the next thing, uh, that, that kind of deals with this information is, uh, personal computing. Okay. And, um, well, let me just jump back here real quick because, uh, the whole hypertext, uh, question and just kind of talk about, I just wanted to kind of show some, some interesting things, right? Because we were talking about the great library of Alexandria that, that burned up. So it'd be nice if we could see what was there, but we, we don't have that. Um, there, there was, let's see if I can, uh, <laughs> you have a Paul uh, outlet in the 19th and 20th century. I, in a way, you could almost call him like the internet pioneer. He actually envisioned this whole system uh, of, of cards and stuff that would automatically be fed around in like tubes and stuff and, and give you information uh, in the same way that we kind of do it nowadays and so it was kind of interesting they actually built part of this machine um although it, it never really went anywhere just because it was impractical okay but you can look over here uh it says from afar anyone would be able to read any text expanded or limited to the desired subject projected on an individual screen thus anyone from his armchair would be able to contemplate the whole of creation or particular parts of it everything in the universe would be registered at a distance as it was produced thus a moving image of the world would be established and you can kind of see this whole like network of uh, 
of buildings and so on kind of interconnected. So, so the ideas here have, have been around for, uh, for a bit. And it's, I think they're, you know, very interested in seeing how this, how this goes. Uh, there's some more of Vannevar Bush's, um, uh, microfilm selector. This was the, the Memex as he was kind of talking about how can you, because the cool thing about microfilm is you can store a lot of information on it. Uh, and so this was, uh, uh, for example, there was this, uh, it's called the micro image Bible. So they, they took the King James Bible and they like stuck all of the different, all the pages over a thousand pages and you can like hold it in your hand. You know, they actually sent it to the moon. That's a little known fact is that that's one of those things that went to the moon. Um, so that's kind of fascinating how, how, uh, you know, I don't know if your library is still, they, they used to have microfilm in displays. It's a, the, the kind of machine you just walk by because nobody's using them anymore, <laughs> but they'd have these huge libraries of microfilm. So you could go back and read a newspaper from like 19, whatever, you know, just put it in there and take a look at it. Um, I've used those a couple of times. And then as far as like the information management, uh, he, he gave some examples of like, you know, ancient documents that, that were, that, that kind of have that idea of like, let's link around to different pages. So for example, in the, the Talmud, you, you would have commentaries on, on different parts of, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. And, you know, they, they put all this information in the same way that we have like commentaries on things that we read about on the internet. You know, these, these, uh, we've always wanted to do things like this, um, or like hyperlinking, like this uh, page back here from the, the Bible. This is the 1611 one. And so you'll see like little little verses listed on the sides in, in the margins. And those are kind of like, yeah, if you go back here, then that relates to what you're reading over here. Uh, they have the Hadith. I think that's like the Arabic um, type thing. Uh, uh, you know, different catalogs like Christopher Columbus's son. There's a, a book catalog over here. So people have been, you know, interested in like, how do you make information more accessible? And not only that, how can you give context to information? All right. Okay, let's see if I missed anything else. This was um, the other thing that Vannevar Bush was, was talking about building using trails was, you know, being able to like draw stuff in there. Like you could be, you could be on the device and you could be drawing stuff. Maybe you're setting bows and arrows or you know, and you wanted to kind of add information to that as you're, as you're learning about it. Okay. I like this. There is a new profession of trailblazers. <laughs> that's just what I'm looking at a room here. It's a room full of trailblazers. There's a uh, Doug Engelbart. We kind of looked at, um, that uh, type of thing. There's a uh, uh, Ted Nelson. Okay. And I just wanted to end over here. You know, you have like a hypertext editing system, intermedia, uh, fresh, the electronic book technology in 1990. Um, <clears throat> and so there, there's always been like a, there's always been like research on the side. So everybody just knows about the internet, but there is still continuing research on hypertext systems um, and how you link information together. That's still ongoing. So it's not, it's not like a dead area, but it's not necessarily a well-known area because everybody's like, well, why don't you just use the internet? But as we mentioned er earlier, there are some reasons why the internet maybe is not as good of a choice. Okay. Um, go back here. Okay. So personal computing. So this is the, this is the next part, right? Because at, at one point you have people, you know, they hear about computers. You can actually just use one. And, and even... When you had a computer at home, I would say just being able to have a computer in your pocket has been a huge change. You know, uh, you need to make an appointment, you put it on your calendar at home. And then if you're at your computer at work, you could pull it up and you, you have everything kind of linking together. And uh, so there's this, uh, you know, famous the 1984 video that Apple did uh, that was kind of talking about, you know, it's just like push for personal computing. And uh, we're going to watch that in in just a second but there is this idea of you know you have micro miniaturization okay so the term microcomputer really meant a much bigger computer <laughs> you know there doesn't take a warehouse anymore it takes you know a much your office space but the, my uh there's like micro you know you have computers mini computers microcomputers. um <clears throat> 
so you have this idea of, you know, writing the cost curve and that kind of led to Moore's law, you know, so processing power is just kind of going up, but you also, at the same time, um, you know, you have IBM, but you also have like the anti-establishment crowd. And these are the people like, you know, information should be free. You know, that was kind of a big push in the sixties. So you had like a merging of these two movements, um, kind of going, uh, going together, which, which kind of drew a lot of, a lot of the growth in personal computing. And, you know, but if you look in the last two decades with, uh, social media, you know, this idea of information wants to be free is not exactly been, <laughs> I, I think it's turned, uh, you know, I would agree with Andy Van Dam. He kind of thinks it's kind of turned for the worst a little bit in terms of privacy, you know, being sold as a, your information being sold as a commodity type item, rather than it be just like, you know, we're, we're thinking like, yeah, we should be able to know how your car is built. So you can just kind of go in there look at the parts and be able to fix it, fix it yourself. But nowadays it's, you know, it's hard it's still hard to do that. And at the same time, too easy to give away too much about yourself. Um, it doesn't help. Okay. So anyways, uh, 1984, uh, everybody familiar with the premise of 1984? The whole the whole idea of like a, a big brother type of government. So let me mute this again. Okay, so that was that was 1984, you know, and and this is echoes that theme. You you have these two movements of you know business, uh, and at the same time, people uh, want information to be readily accessible to everybody. Okay, uh, I, I would say it's probably in line with some of the hippie movement a little bit, but that has not materialized. I think uh, for recently. Okay, um, I saw that. Okay, so the next thing is connect the world. So we look at Facebook, right? To give the original mission statement was to give people the power to share and to make the world more open and connected. So I would say that's in line with the idea of like information wants to be free. Although I don't know if I would agree that that's how Facebook turned out. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, it, people, there's lots of perspectives on there, but, you know, generally, you know, you have to be careful. You know, you can't just like, yeah, everything's free because, you know, it does turn out that people do are affected in, in bad ways uh, by social media. OK, um, so I got to watch the time here because I have one more video we're going we're gonna to watch. OK, so the, the next thing here is ubiquitous computing. Now, you may have heard the term ubiquitous computing, although <laughs> this was a, a, a term coined by Mark Weiser uh, a while back. But. You know, and, and we see things like the Internet of Things and we see uh, smart devices. We see this terminology kind of used around. But we, we still don't have, you know, real and virtual spaces like all together. I mean, case in point, I have to like jump to that machine and press mute and unmute my computer and then I have to go back and forth. And then we still can't see Nelson on the screen, even though so we have a student with us. But it would be nice if he was here. You know, so we, we have not quite realized the potential there uh, of being able to really have computing everywhere, but it, it has to have the right context. It's got to be uh, have everything together. So 
uh, forgive me, I forgot Buxton's first name, but he gave a lecture on this term called ubiety. And the idea here is it's not just about having computers everywhere, um, but you have to have uh, some context, right? So importance of place. So just because your phone can be everywhere doesn't mean that you should use it at the dinner table when you're meeting, you know, it's just not the appropriate place for that, you know, unless it's like an emergency phone call, because then you're just being distracted. And it's like, I, did we come here to eat dinner or for me to look at you, stare at your phone? You know, there's that, there's that element there. Um, or uh, some kind of moral order or context. In other words, you know, do the devices do what's appropriate? You know, like surveillance uh, might be kind of an issue there. Like, should we just have surveillance video available to everybody? You know, there might be some issues there. Um, and it could be obeying social relationships, not just physical constraints. So it's not just enough for us to think about the device is only on from this time to this time. It, it, we have to think about, well, what social context does that really matter in? You know, because that's really we're concerned with how it's um, <laughs> affecting the lives of people. Okay, so in other words, not just everywhere, but cooperatively. We're using the devices because it's helping us, not because they're just everywhere, okay? Um, so at Xerox Park, a, a lot of the work that they did had to do, yeah, let's develop devices that have potential independently, but it's even more powerful when you can get them to work together. And we kind of saw that in the mother of all demos where just having all those things working together, just kind of each individual tool is interesting by itself, but it's even more powerful when you can use them together. Okay, um, so natural user interfaces. Now, kind of, you know, what's the role of a user interface? And a lot of, a lot of times what we're thinking about is, okay, how do you interact with your computer? Okay, and it's, it's managing, you know, maybe a complex piece of software in a way that you can actually use it effectively. Okay. And <clears throat> we also wanted to address the question of like, how can you create a harmonious user experience, you know, make it something that feels fluid and it's not clunky. Okay. But uh, there's this idea and we're going to end with this video essentially, but what is the ultimate user interface? Um, and uh, Andy Van Dam kind of thinks, is it kind of an, uh, is it more of a necessary evil? Like just having a user interface, should you need to even have one? Okay. And he kind of brought up this phrase, you know, like you have terms like the aesthetics of a good UI. Well, if it was, you know, it's kind of like um, trying to dress up, like interacting with the computer is the problem. So why are we trying to dress up that interaction? Uh, <laughs> in a way, it's like, we don't want the interaction. We don't want to have to be forced today to use a mouse, right? That's like saying, well, we can make the using the mouse more elegant, and you think, well, but I want to draw. <laughs> That's not the most natural way for me to do it. Okay. Uh, one example you gave was the violin. Violin is one of those instruments. Uh, I tried to pick up the violin when I was older, and it didn't work out very well. I'm a pretty good guitarist. That's kind of my main instrument of choice. But the violin is, is very difficult. And at least for me, it is. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's got probably one of the most horrendous user interfaces possible. Right. I mean, you would like to just pick it up and make beautiful music with it, but you just can't. It takes years of practice to get really, really good at it. And so this is a, a case of, yeah, it has a great aesthetics. I mean, it's hard to find instruments more beautiful than violin. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, but it's really difficult to use. <laughs> so that's kind of the uh, idea there. So you know, user interfaces should, you know, know what intent is. Uh, might need some kind of, you know, natural language understanding and so on. So we're going to we're going to end by watching this video of Apple's Knowledge Navigator. And um, and then we'll be finished. But this is interesting how many of things have not yet been done from this particular video.
All right. So we're, we're pretty much finished for the day, but hopefully that kind of leaves you for, you know, a taste of like 1987. That was the world they were thinking about. And now we're what 2017. That was 40 years ago, but 30 years ago, 40 years, 30 years ago, it was 30 years ago. And I don't think we've remotely touched that experience yet. So still lots of problems that, that, that remain in, in terms of that. So, uh, all right. So I think that's it. If you have any questions, uh, come by during office hours, shoot me an email, uh, anything like that. Thank you.